is from Ephesians, the fifth chapter. For once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it is said, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. The Gospel for this Sunday is one of the long Gospel readings that we find in Lent. It's from the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John. As Jesus walked along, he saw a blind man from birth. Excuse me, let me say that again. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man that was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the work of him who sent me. While it is day, night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now, it was the Sabbath day when Jesus had made mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then? Does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So, for the second time, they called the man who had been born blind. And they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, 
I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Here ends our Gospel reading for the day. Let us pray. Dear God, open our eyes so that we can see. Amen. Friends in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Creator and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Who is welcome in the company of God's people? Who can enter the temple or the synagogue or the church? The disciples ask Jesus about this blind man, wondering whether he or his parents sinned that he was born blind. They ask this question because to them, it is obvious that this blind man is in some way cursed because of a sin. And because of this sin and his disabilities, he is of less value than people who are healthy and whole in body and mind. It's a way of thinking that values people according to their ability and skills so that some people are more important and valuable than others. The disciples just want to know, who was it that sinned? Who is the one responsible for this curse from God? Because in this way of thinking, God always keeps track of our sins, and sins always have consequences. Perhaps this man's parents were guilty of some sin for which there were never any consequences. But because sin must always have consequences, their child was born blind. It's a bit like the Hindu idea of karma. Everything we do comes back to us, the good and the bad. When we do wrong, we eventually experience suffering. When we do good, it comes around to us as a blessing. In Hinduism, there's also reincarnation. So that the karma you build up in one life 
you experience in the next. So if your life is full of suffering, it's because of all the bad karma from your last life. If you are blessed with wealth and opportunity, it's the good karma from your last life. In Hinduism, it's not so much that God or a God decided all of this. It's more like the law of gravity. What goes around always has to come around. It's a system that allows people to take complete credit for whatever wealth or success they have in life because, well, it all comes from the good things they did in their past incarnation. Likewise, you can look down on people who are poor or who have physical or mental disabilities because that all comes from the bad things they did in their past incarnation. Pretty much eliminates any need for compassion or humility, except that the lack of compassion or humility in one's life would be counted as bad karma and you'd experience the consequences in your ne next life. Jesus makes it clear that neither karma nor the disciples' understanding of sin and its consequences for people's lives explains anything about how God is active in the world. Neither the blind man nor, the, nor his parents sin, Jesus says. But the man's blindness does give Jesus an opportunity to demonstrate the love and grace of God. Rather than judge this man or his parents, Jesus demonstrates God's commitment to value and welcome all people, no matter what the circumstances of their lives. And that's the thing. All people are made in the image of God, and all people deserve our compassion. They deserve to be treated with dignity and respect, no matter what their circumstances, no matter what disabilities they may live with, no matter what their racial or ethnic identity, no matter what their gender or sexual orientation or age or IQ, no matter whether they live in a homeless shelter or a luxury home. All people deserve dignity, respect, and compassion. We find far too many ways to explain why people deserve their successes or their failures. Like the disciples who want to identify the sin that was responsible for this man's blindness. We can point to all sorts of bad choices that people may have made along the way that led to the problems that have come their way. Or we can praise the wisdom and tenacity and courage of the really successful person. And this is really no different from the disciples' idea or the idea of karma. It gives us justification for thinking better of some people and less of others. But when we look at the details of people's lives, we realize that those explanations just aren't true. For those who are successful, there are always people who encourage them along the way or who opened opportunities for them, or who navigated them through their education or training, or who helped them when they faced uncertainty. In the same way, the people who end up with nothing and nowhere to go, like the blind beggar in our gospel, have often not had the opportunities or encouragement or guidance or education and often systems beyond their power have just worked against them. So Jesus meets the blind man with compassion, respect, and dignity, and he heals him. It is another of Jesus' signs, the sign of Jesus' authority 
a sign of the presence of God's kingdom among us, a sign of how God's people are called to act in ways that imitate Jesus. In the book of Acts, Peter and John encounter a man who has been lame from birth. He's begging at the entrance of the temple. The disciples say they have no silver or gold to give him, but what they have, they give him. In the name of Jesus Christ, they say, stand up and walk. The man stands and he begins to walk. He enters the temple walking and leaping and praising God. The disciples use the resources they have to act with God's compassion. They do not ask who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born lame. No, they have learned the, the lesson. And now they have the ability to be a sign of God's loving compassion for this person as well. And what about us? When we honor the dignity of every person made in God's image, we are signs of God's kingdom. When we use our resources and abilities to extend compassion and care to people who struggle and suffer in our world, we become signs of God's kingdom. When we feed the hungry and shelter the homeless and care for the sick and befriend the lonely and encourage the despairing, we are signs of God's kingdom. When we welcome the stranger, and invite them to participate in our life in Christ, we are signs of God's kingdom. And what Jesus does in this story is more than give a sign to his disciples so they may believe in him. What Jesus does is heal a man who, because of his disability, was cut off from full participation in the life of his community and was unable to live a meaningful and productive life. Jesus sees in this blind man one of God's beloved children, someone who bears the image of God. So Jesus uses his healing power to make him whole. This is not an act of charity. Jesus restores for this man the ability to fully participate in the life of his community. It's not charity, it's justice. It's another sign of the presence of God's kingdom in Jesus. So when we use our resources to support those who have been left out without the resources and skills to live meaningful and productive lives, we become signs of the kingdom. When we strive for justice for all people, when we oppose racism and bigotry, when we imagine a society where all people can live meaningful and productive lives, and when we work to create that kind of world around us, we are signs of God's kingdom. And God promises to heal us, to open our eyes and make us whole so that we can be signs of God's kingdom.